Hello, I'm Bruce DePoy. Coming up today on News Talk, how is ISIL able to recruit Americans and Europeans to wage war on their own people? The group is making significant inroads thanks in part to a canny social media campaign. But what other factors are at work? We'll ask George Washington University scholar Lorenzo Vedino. Then, it turns out that the train derailment downtown, the one that caused a huge traffic backup all around the region last week, was caused by a condition that Metro knew about but did not fix. How can this be? And when will the embattled agency finally have a new leader? We'll put these questions and others to D.C. Councilman and Metro Board Member Jack Evans, and we'll take your calls. From News Channel 8, this is News Talk with Bruce DePoint. Terrific to have you with us on this beautiful Thursday here in the nation's capital. Thanks for making us part of your day. We've got a great lineup for you. This is an issue to begin with that is bedeviling Homeland Security personnel here and in Europe. How ISIL is able to recruit Americans and Europeans from abroad to com and encourage them to commit acts of violence on their own people and in their own country. This was the subject of a symposium recently at George Washington University, and Professor Lorenzo Vedino was one of the featured participants. He joins us now. It's great to have you with us. Thanks very much for coming. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a tough nut to crack. Mm. How is ISIL able to uh, connect with people, uh, encourage people, uh, get people to do things that maybe otherwise they wouldn't have done from such a great geographic distance. Sure. Uh, well, there's a variety of factors at play here. I mean, the phenomenon of people in the West, they join up with extremist groups in far-flung places in the world. I mean, it's not new. Remember, of Americans who joined Al-Qaeda already 15 years ago. The difference now uh, is that the numbers are much bigger than in the past. We're talking about four to 5,000 Westerners who have joined ISIL. In the past, we were talking about maybe a few hundred people. And a big role here is played by social media. Uh, the ability that ISIL has uh, in talking to people directly, day to day, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, through Facebook, through Twitter, through Instagram, and a variety of other platforms online, it's something that groups in the past did not have. And ISIL has been extremely good at using this. So it's whether it's ISIL directly or sympathizers, cheerleaders of the group uh, globally, that manage to talk to people in America. Whoever has a computer, whoever has a smartphone, can be in touch with people there. And we have cases of ISIL reaching out directly. It's almost like the grooming that pedophiles do online. Mm -hmm. They reach out to vulnerable people and they try to lure them to, to Syria and Iraq and to radicalize them. 99.99% .99 of the people that they would reach out to if they were doing it in a, in a random, uh, not thoughtful way, would be like, you know, they would reject it out of hand. How do they find anyone who would connect with the ideology they espouse and the desire to harm Americans that clearly is, is such a significant motivation? Well, again, we have different dynamics at play. In many cases, the first approach maybe is made by people who already sympathize with the ideology and through social media connect with people with ISIS. So if people are already somewhat interested in the subject mm -hmm. of Syria, of a certain interpretation, sort of radical interpretation of Islam, and in certain spaces online, in some cases also in the physical space. I don't think we should say that it's just online. We have cases, particularly in Europe, but also in the United States, where the one-on-one -on -one real world interaction does play a role. So when there are these places where there are at least an interest, an inkling of an interest in that ideology, then ISIL sympathizers are very good at developing that relationship. But we do have cases of people uh, that are ISIL sympathizers that reach out to people that they deem vulnerable online and they really have this process of grooming and radicalizing and introducing people who had absolutely no clue about and no interest about ISIL, about mm -hmm. geopolitics, about radical Islam. Uh, and they introduce them. And there have been a couple of great stories in the media about girls in rural parts of the country uh, from a Christian background, but for one reason or the other, for psychological issues that they had, personal issues that they had, they found themselves sympathetic to the cause. And they're literally groomed by people online, by ISIL sympathizers online. Is it surprising that whatever's going on in their lives, you use the term vulnerable, that that could lead to uh, this sort of uh, sympathy? Uh, 
It's no different from Feeling other something. ideologies we've seen in the past. Uh, I was reading an interview with, uh, with a French militant uh, who was a convert uh, who went to Syria and came back disillusioned and basically what he was saying said I ran into I was at a bad time of my life uh, uh, crime problems with the family unemployed uh, not finding a place in life uh, and uh, I stumbled upon uh, people who introduced me to ISIL ideology had there been bikers, or biker gang, criminals, skinheads, I would have fallen for that. Uh, it simply sometimes is whoever you sort of stumbled upon that introduces you to a message, it gives you a purpose in life, it gives you an identity, and ISIL is very good at doing that. It is very good at having this narrative tailored to Western youth. And we see, for example, a very high number of converts, uh, people who do not come from a Muslim background. In some places we're talking about 25, 30 percent of people who are converts. It just ISIL provides that ideology, that message of empowerment, of identity, that sort of tells you there's not a problem with you, there's a problem with society. Join us and we recreate, we will create the perfect utopian society. Mm. Given the ease with which we can now connect with folks uh, literally around the globe, uh, simply by virtue of our ability to connect to the web, how big a challenge does this pose for Homeland Security uh, people in America and in Europe? Um, we shouldn't exaggerate the problem. Uh, the numbers are bigger than what they have ever been. Uh, at the same time, I think law enforcement, particularly in the United States, has a handle on this. We're still talking about uh, it, numbers in the hundreds. Uh, so the FBI is understandably co very concerned about this. Uh, we're talking about uh, 200 individuals who left the United States uh, uh, to at least try to go to fight with ISIL. Uh, the FBI has spoken about investigations open in all 50 states. Uh, so the numbers are higher, and for every person that has tried to go, there are at least five or six uh, who are online, flirting with the ideology, interested in, in this. Uh, uh, one of the issues that we have seen is that in some cases these individuals are interested in going to Syria, but in some other cases they are just interested in doing something in the United States. And we have seen these cases, uh, think about Chattanooga for example, just a few weeks ago, of people who sympathize with the ideology are not necessarily connected uh, operationally to ISIL or any other group, but they take it upon themselves to overnight, really, without giving any sign uh, beforehand, do something like carry out an attack in the United States. That moment with one shifts from simply sympathizing with the ideology and doing something that is not criminally relevant, uh, you may end up on the radar screen of law enforcement, but it's not a, pen, a criminally relevant behavior to actually doing something can take place overnight without any warning, and that's really the big problem for law enforcement. How do you catch that moment when one makes that shift? American uh, law enforcement personnel are very plain uh, about their uh, fears of the, the lone wolf, the person uh, acting not as part of a, a group or an, or, or an organization in the community, but <clears throat> who's been maybe radicalized and encouraged to commit a bad act through a, a social media interaction with somebody uh, thousands of miles away on a different, on a different continent. Uh, these are, these are the people who, these are some of the people who are the ticking time bomb yeah. who self-activate or activate based on some communication that has law enforcement so concerned. It's the lone wolf who springs up in a, you know, we've seen the movie theaters, just wherever, whenever, uh, harming innocent people. Yeah, that's the dynamic we've seen. Uh, uh, if you remember the attack that took place in Garland, Texas, just a few weeks ago, that was the dynamic. You had two guys who had been flirting with... Uh, extremist ideology for 10 years at least. Nonetheless, I've never done anything. I never tried to carry out an attack. At some point, one of them starts chatting on Twitter with some ISIL people in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and they tell him, listen, there's a group of people who are drawing cartoons, offensive cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad in Texas. You have to do something. And they really egg him on to do something. As the FBI director said in a testimony recently, it's like the devil on the shoulder telling him, kill, kill, kill. That immediacy that social media has uh, with messages coming on your phone every two minutes saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you not carrying out attacks? There are people who are mocking the Prophet. Why are you not fighting? Why are you not killing enemies of Islam? And this is somebody who, after 10 years of doing nothing, of being just online and flirting with the ideology, took it upon himself to drive with a friend from Phoenix, Arizona, to Dallas, Texas, and 
try to kill people. He, uh, the attack was thwarted by, by law enforcement, but we have these dynamics, and for law enforcement, that's a nightmare scenario. How do you stop that? It's so quick in how it takes place, but it's very difficult to stop. You're living in the U.S. again after some time in Europe. Can you talk about what the dynamic is there, what the fear level is, and what, yeah. the, what some of the attempts at response are? The dynamics are different. Uh, uh, the reason why I say that in the United States the problem is not as big is because I compare it to the size uh, of the problem in Europe and the numbers, the sheer numbers are so much bigger. Uh, we're talking, as I said, about 200 Americans who have tried to go to Syria. We're talking about 4,000 Europeans. We have even small countries like Belgium with 400 people. Belgium is the size of Virginia. Uh, so you can imagine, but it's a completely different phenomenon with much smaller law enforcement and intelligence agencies. So very different size of the problem. The dynamics are also somewhat different. Here is more online radicalization, isolated cases, occasional clusters, but it's mostly scattered individuals here and there. In Europe, Europe, you have groups of friends who go and live for Syria. We're talking about maybe 20, 30 people from the same neighborhood that go and fight. Very different dynamic. So there's a tough law enforcement approach, uh, which in Europe is not probably as aggressive as it is in the U.S. They're using much more softer techniques in Europe. I mentioned at the outset that you were part of a recent symposium at George Washington University that brought together several people who've studied this issue in depth. Can you give us just a brief sense of, of what the discussion was and our uh, folks talking about how, uh, about efforts to, to either reduce the sense of isolation and vulnerability and the other factors we've discussed that make people uh, potential uh, targets for, for, uh, for ISIL outreach and you know, what they're doing on the law enforcement side. Give us a sense, if you would, of what came out of the symposium. Yeah, the, the symposium, which was organized by the, the Center that I run, the Program on Extremism at GW, uh, looked at the, the situation, the dynamics there, but also looked at solutions. And obviously there's a traditional hard counterterrorism solution to the problem. Uh, problem is the monitoring, is arresting people. That's undeniably a big part of it. It should be the cornerstone of any policy. But given the sheer numbers and the dynamics that we see, we argue, and this is something that uh, in Europe is very common, but it's also very much debated in the administration, uh, at the FBI, there should be other tactics, uh, softer tactics of uh, introducing a counter-narrative, of doing interventions with young people. A lot of people that are flirting with the ideology are teenagers, are minors. Uh, in some cases, and this is something that the FBI is doing to some degree, mm -hmm. uh, having somebody like a mentor to go talk to this 15, 16 year old uh, can sway him from the ideology. It's not going to work in all cases. It needs to be done in the right way, but in some cases it does work uh, and it's probably the right thing to do. Counter narrative is, uh, I think, is the phrase. Counter narrative, you know. interventions, the counter narrative for the larger target audience uh, and the one-on-one -on -one intervention, the individual interventions, having uh, the same thing that happens with gangs, if you think about it, and the dynamics are to some degree similar. Having somebody that can be a figure, authoritative figure, go talk to this young person mm -hmm. telling him, what are you doing? This, what you're saying is wrong, what they're feeding you, that propaganda is wrong, and breaking it down and trying to sway him, move him away from that ideology. Professor Lorenzo Vedino is with George Washington University, part of a recent symposium on this issue, as we mentioned at the outset. Thank you very much for being with us today. I hope you come back and be with us again. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you very much for your time. We'll step aside here. A quick break. Back, though, with much more news talk. Jack Evans is next.